and uh, thanks for inviting me to give this talk. Um, so today I'll be talking about deep learning interpretability and I will be trying to cover some, at the same time, some uncomfortable topics, if we can call them this way. That is why like the title of the talk is a myth busting attempt for deep learning interpretability. Um, I would like to take this nice opportunity, not only to present my research to you, but also to take a moment and really discuss the taxonomies and the different beliefs that uh, live around this, uh, this interesting topic. Um, so yes, my name is Mara Graziani. I'm a PhD student and I'm starting now my fourth year. So um, it's uh, going towards the final year. Um, and uh, indeed, I started this path with both the University of Geneva and SSO. Um, so my work is funded by a European project uh, through SSO and the European project is called AI for Media and it's the, the aim is joining forces from more than 30 European partners to make some sense of the impact that AI can have on our lives, on the media industry and all the societal implications that might derive from this. Um, so just to give you a bit more of background about who I am, I took my bachelor's degree in information technology engineering in Rome and La Sapienza. And then I read for a research-based masters in machine learning in the UK in Cambridge where I started researching on deep learning interpretability. And then I continued kind of covering this topic during my PhD research here. Um, my main focus is the development of tools that uh, can be used to interpret deep learning models. And I am focusing specifically on the applications uh, of deep learning to the medical domain. So to, the, to focusing, uh, focusing to tailor uh, the interpretability of deep learning methods on the needs of uh, clinicians and um, it's particularly in the domain of histopathology. So I mostly work with medical images of human tissues for cancer detection and stage grading. And I will present some examples of these later in the talk. I would also like to acknowledge the collaboration with many other colleagues, including my supervisor Henning and uh, Stefan, that is my supervisor at the University of Geneva. So the outline for today is to first discuss, as I was saying, some topics regarding common places in machine learning interpretability and the fact that this may derive from what I see and the discordance in the taxonomies um, in the literature regarding this field. And after discussing this, I will then present three of my latest publications, uh, starting from the evaluation of popular uh, explainability for AI methods on histopathology images. Um, then introducing an interpretable approach for pruning deep learning networks, also for histopathology images. And uh, finally, introducing our work and ideas on uh, guiding CNNs towards learning relevant features together with uh, interpretability techniques. So the first common place I hear often in deep learning is that we most care about, what we most care about is to obtain high performance and that is why we minimize the loss or if you want to maximize the accuracy on the test set. So this is reasonable to me and I think it's quite legit, um, especially from a generalization perspective. So by minimizing our loss and our unseen data, we are trying to guarantee that the network will also generalize to new inputs. The issue though is that when we move to real world data sets, things do not really work quite as we were expecting. Um, so this graph here on the right is essentially showing um, the porting of an application of a deep learning application from an in-house test data set to a real world test data set uh, in the medical domain. So it's an intracranial hemorrhage um, detection system. Um, and what, we, what it's showing here is that the area under the rock curve is not sufficiently high on the real data to transfer the network uh, trained on retrospective data to the real world. So we, we also have seen this actually in natural images. So I don't know how many uh, of you have heard of um, racial or gender biases in the data affecting the decisions, for example, for recruiting assistants um, or the sensibility of deep learning methods to adversarial attacks. So what I'm saying here is that um, there are new desiderata that are emerging that um, are, might be interpretability, fairness and robustness. Um, of the deep learning application. And this may be additional ways of estimating the performance of the network. Another common place is that, um, okay, so as deep learning are 
black boxes, then we can use random forests instead of decision trees. Um, the issue with trees is that the number of terminal nodes has a complexity that scales exponentially with the depth of the tree. So the deeper the tree is, um, meaning the larger number of steps we have to take before actually reaching a decision node, um, then the more complex it becomes to interpret the decision actually. Um, so it is true that in this kind of models, it is what is um, the so-called trade-off between uh, complexity and interpretability of the decision-making because the more complex the model we're using, the tree we're using, um, the more we're losing on interpretability. And decision trees are interpretable only if, you are, if they are relatively shallow. Um, and all of this is uh, taken and inspired to other discussions um, that are um, that you can find also online. Uh, you can check for Sarah Hooker's observations or Bing Kim's talks, and they all kind of addressing and trying to arise the awareness and the fact that um, there might be common places and uh, the, per the perspective that we have on machine learning models may change depending on the use we make of them. Um, another point that I would like to underline is that. Um, the misunderstanding of interpretability for transparency. So when we talk about interpreting models, we do not need to understand every bit and byte of the inner model components. And so we're not really aiming all of the times towards transparency. Um, the need of interpretability depends in fact on the domain sensitivity. Um, so on what are essentially the implications of the automated decisions. So in applications as such as health, assisted driving, um, social studies, uh, such as credit, credit allowance, for example, and so on, we do need interpretability because the decision-making may have an important impact on the life of someone else. Um, so these are the so-called high stake applications where we might want to um, understand the model decisions. We might want to address the so-called why questions. So why did the model take a certain decision and not something else? Um, but this doesn't necessarily translate into um, a transparent model where we know every little component of the model. Um, so finally, um, another uh, common place is that there is a clear and unique definition for model interpretability. Um, and, and you would probably find out as it also happened to me that you would strongly disagree on what is uh, this uh, unique clear defi definition um, with your colleagues because um, it happened to me, for example, that my definition of interpretability I thought was quite clear and uh, uniquely defined uh, was very different from the one of the colleague working in the office next to mine. So this is quite a complex issue in fact. Um, and I think this is due to the fact that in every domain where machine learning is applied, we may have different targets for the interpretability analysis. So as a consequence, and we will also discuss this later in the talk, um, also evaluating uh, the interpretability analysis becomes non-trivial. If we don't know exactly what it is that we want, it is more difficult to, to evaluate it. Um, so with this, I don't want to, to say that, I mean, uh, everything is lost and we should just uh, stop talking about this because it's too messy. Um, what, is a, what is a formal definition for interpretable and if, if we can find a definition, what should we use? And does this mean, for example, that interpretable and explainable are the same thing? Or why do we say sometimes interpretability in AI and other times uh, explainability and explainable AI? Um, and what I did here is I started uh, just checking from the literature. So here we can see that, uh, for example, the term interpretable machine learning uh, often re refers to research on models and algorithms that are considered as inherently interpretable, um, meaning transparent, uh, while explainable AI often refers to the generation of postdoc explanations. Um, but then if you start checking uh, other, with another search, you may, you may end up finding that explanation and interpretability can be equated, um, that they are very closely related. And again, if you continue, we can see that um, in another paper, they are stating that there are instead not noticeable differences uh, among the concept of interpretability and explainability. 
and, and so on. So you will see that there are several attempts of actually clarifying the taxonomy for interpretable AI. And this might be quite confusing and frustrating for all of those that are starting um, entering in this world. And also for those like me that it's been a few years that are trying to, um, to understand to run myself and to derive my own perspective um, on this. Um, I have this spreadsheet file that I can share with you and that I also shared with my colleagues where I list all the literature I could find and the references to interpretable, explainable, transparent, intelligible and causal design. Um, the way I like to think um, and that simplifies for me the understanding the background is to think of um, interpretability as the ability to explain or to present in understandable terms to a human. Um, obviously with the fact that the human might not necessarily be an expert in the machine learning and keeping always constantly in mind that the own definition of interpretability may vary depending on the context, on the applicative domain and on the scope for the interpretability analysis. Um, what is it instead commonly agreed upon as helpful terminology uh, to classify the current interpretability techniques? So um, I would like to introduce this here because I think it will be helpful also for later on in the talk. Um, a local explanation is an explanation for deep learning decision that is true only for a specific instance, so only for a specific input. While a global explanation is an explanation that is true for an entire set of inputs. So, um, we are trying to explain the decisions for an entire set uh, of inputs belonging to the same class, for example. Um, then a model specific approach is a way of building an interpretability analysis that is built in the specific model. So where, for example, interpretability is added as a constraint to the main objectives. Um, so for example, a network with some kind of attention mechanism give a sort of model specific interpretation for their for the model behavior. Whereas postdoc approaches are a bit broader and they can be applied to any model without the need of retraining the learned parameters. So I think this is a great way and a great starting point for the interpretability analysis, it should, since it doesn't really require the need for building a specific model for having an interpretable design. You can take whatever model you had before that was working and was working well, and you can start a postdoc analysis trying to understand and uncover um, the inner mechanisms inside the model. And, um, and so to move on and categorize the different techniques, I find this scheme quite useful, where essentially we're distinguished first between uh, model and data interpretability. So if we're trying to interpret the data by, ex by exploration techniques that can be, I don't know, principle of component analysis uh, or um, late, different uh, and latest techniques like Isomap or UMAP um, or generation of prototypes that we're trying to actually understand the data and to see if there are in inherent biases in our data. Um, and this is data interpretability. If instead we have already a model uh, or we want to build a model with interpretability, then we need to think of if we want to have a model specific design with interpretability that may be either built in. Uh, if we want to have a model that is so-called intelligible or inherently interpretable, such as, I don't know, linear regression models, for example, or shallow decision trees. Um, or we can think of uh, the interpretability taken as a postdoc approach, uh, where we try to generate explanations for a given um, for a given input or for a class of inputs. And in this case, we have uh, rule instructions where we try to replicate, for example, the decision making of the model with if then rules or decision trees, um, and attribution methods where we might have uh, one instance and we're trying to attribute reasons for the decision made by a certain model. Um, to the set of input features, for example, or to concepts in, in other cases. Um, so since I will mention um, some of our research that focused on uh, local interpretable uh, model diagnostic explanations, so LIME and class activation mappings, I would like to briefly mention um, these two methods that are methods for generating local um, attribution to features. So, um, they generate postdoc. They both generate postdoc explanations for a given input, um, and 
and this is uh, this explanation is given in terms of the input features. That's why it's called attribution method. So in um, local interpretable model agnostic explanations, an intelligible surrogate model that is generally a linear classifier is used to approximate in a neighborhood of data points the decision making of a black box model. So for example, and the, the continuous curve here is the decision line and the decision of the, of the black box model that could be a deep learning or a complex model. And the points within these neighborhoods are points that are sampled to compute the, um, the local approximation and to train the surrogate model. And the, the green line is the local linear surrogate that explains or approximates the decision making in that neighborhood. Um, so this method is quite flexible and universal, it can be applied to any model. Um, it has some, um, some um, disadvantages, uh, if we can call them in this way. For example, the, the size of the local neighborhood is a hyperparameter, um, and the robustness to different sizes is yet undefined. Um, and it is, for especially for images, um, the construction of the neighborhood um, and the generation of the surrogate, the training of the surrogate, um, essentially counts on um, the choice of super pixels uh, taken from the image. And uh, this method is very sensitive to the algorithm that is used to choose the super pixels. We will see this also um, later in the talk. As for um, class activation mapping, I actually expect several of you to have heard already of uh, CAM, grad CAM, and uh, activation maps, uh, heat maps of attention. Um, so this technique in general gives an idea of where the network is looking in the image to, to take the decision. Um, and this is obtained by aggregating the feature maps as a weighted sum operation, where the weights are given by a global average pool layer before the final softmax. Um, so now some networks like Inception, for, for example, have already uh, global average pooling before softmax. Um, whereas before, um, for example, in AlexNet, this needed to be added as, as an additional layer. Um, but it was anyway very fast uh, to train. So this method was very easy to apply and very intuitive to understand. And it had a great, great success. Um, in fact, for his transparency and, and directness. Um, the issue with this is that it only gives you a qualitative evaluation and it seems not so robust to multiple instances of the same object within the image. And this is something that we have very frequently in histopathology images where we have multiple nuclei in, this, in the same image. So these two methods, Lime and CAM, are quite popular, as I was saying, because they're intuitive to understand, they're easy to apply, and they reported impressive results on the domain of natural images. Um, so in our latest paper, evaluation and comparison of explainability um, methods and visualizations in histopathology uh, that will be presented in, in February at the workshop at the um, AAA. Um, so this, this method, in, in this paper, we thought of evaluating these methods in the histopathology context. And in particular, we started from the affirmation and the belief that the sole qualitative inspection of the heat maps may not be sufficient to understand uh, what are the explanations actually explaining, what are they actually pointing to. Um, so we set the objective of developing a quantitative evaluation procedure for these methods. And to do so, we looked mostly at two measures, the intersection of a union with different nucleotypes and the structure of similarity among different explanations. So we used um, the PANUC dataset um, that is a, a pretty impressive dataset, I have to say, with different uh, types of um, tissues and with uh, segmentations of different nucleotide for each tissues, um, such as, for example, neoplastic, inflammatory, epithelial, and connective nuclei within the, the image. Um, and we, we focused only on the breast category of this data set. And we took our binary classifier that is an inception V3 model that is trained on breast tissue pathology images um, in general from the chameleon data set. So we have a large collection of, um, of croppings of at high resolution of um, tissue pathology um, patches of uh, tissue. Um, and we trained this model to detect the presence of two more in the image. 
so it's just a binary classification task. Is there two more? Yes, is there, or there's not two more. Um, and we generated explanations on these Panuk images. So we added the Panuk test, uh, the Panuk data to our training data. We reserved um, a split for testing and we evaluated on the testing data for the Panuk the, the explanations. So in this way, we could work to different nuclei types. Um, and here I'm showing what it looks like to have just a qualitative evaluation of the heat maps. Um, but I would like to mostly focus on what we actually, uh, what we did see and what we could quantify. So what were our contributions in this paper? So we started by looking at how similar the heat maps were between two different methods. So we took pairs of methods, for example, CAM and LIME. Um, and we observed that exp the explanations have pretty low similarity scores. What does it mean this? It's like, if I take a heat map, generate for, for example, a true positive image, um, and I take a heat map uh, generated by class activation mapping and a heat map generated by line, um, I want to see whether the two heat maps agree in telling me what was the area in the image that was the, the most responsible for the classification as two more, and it was a correct classification also. So um, the fact that the structural similarity between these two heat maps is pretty low, it's telling us that the heat maps actually rarely agree on what are the areas that cause the prediction to be, to be that of the two more class. And this was the first thing that we observed. Then we wanted to look at the intersection of a union of the heat maps with the different nuclear types. So we were focusing on one method at a time, for example, on class activation maps. And we wanted to quantify the attention of the heat map. So the, the how much of the this red area in the heat map that is highly activated uh, is actually focusing on nuclei that are um, known as relevant in the, the classification of of tumor and the presence of tumor. And as a disclaimer, neoplastic nuclei are generally the most relevant category to identify the presence of tumor. So um, what, it, what this plot is showing is that the IUU of the CAM and line with the new plastic category is quite, actually quite high. So at the beginning, we were very excited and we thought, okay, this is good then because it means that our heat maps might be pointing to different nuclei because they don't agree, but at least they're pointing to neoplastic nuclei. The problem is that the distribution of the neoplastic nuclei compared to other nuclei in our data set is quite different. So there might be a bias already in the data set um, in the number of nuclei and in the frequency of neoplastic nuclei that you might have. Um, and in fact, when we compare um, when we compare the the intersection of a union um, of our train network with a network with randomly initialized weights, meaning that is a network that has not been trained, has never seen a natural image nor a histopathology image, just just random values in the weights. Um, when we compare this intersection of a unions, we see that the difference um, in the two quantities is not significant. Um, so this means that there is no uh, significant difference before and after the training of a CNN on histopathology images for the classification of tumor. Um, so the attention is the same. And this is sort of telling us that we might think from the qualitative analysis and from inspecting the images, we can see that there is maybe an attention on the neoplastic nuclei, but we really need quantitative measures to establish how much this is happening across the whole data set and how much, how does this relate with the, um, with the already underlying distribution of different nuclei types in our data. And finally, in the paper, we also discuss, as I was mentioning also before, of the high sensitivity um, of Lyme to changes in the hyperparameters um, in the super pixel choice and, and the random seed. So we, we did different experiments that um, you, can, you, can send, you can see in the paper and I can send you the PDF if you cannot find it, but we try to estimate if essentially um, if we can um, estimate the repeatability of Lyme explanations for different seed types, for example, and how stable and like what it has to be an optimal choice of the hyperparameters to have stable explanations. So to always obtain uh, very similar explanations. And you can see that um, it's very difficult to find the balance between having um, very uh, robust Lyme representations and very repeatable also, because when it becomes robust, it might not be repeatable. 
So this is sort of uh, what we observed. And, and the takeaway from this work is essentially that at least in histopathology, I think the current explanation methods still have limitations. And there is a lot of room for more relevant work towards having stable and trustworthy and reliable explanations for this field. Okay, so I would present now our work on using interpretability, the interpretability analysis instead in a proactive way. You will see it's a different interpretability analysis. Or to improve then the performance on the main task given the understanding that we collected. So the, the paper is called Interpretable CNN Pruning for Preserving Scale Covariant Features in Medical Imaging. Uh, I presented this recently in, um, at Mikai uh, 2020. Um, and the, um, the main problem we addressed um, is the crucial difference in how scale is interpreted in the medical and in the natural domain. So the observation viewpoint is often unknown in natural images. Um, so when we pre-train on data sets such as ImageNet, for example, the CNNs learn implicitly by the data to be invariant to changes in object scale. So for example, here on the image on the left, I'm showing that the picture of the albatross um, in the albatross, in, the, in this uh, class, the albatross may actually appear naturally at different scales. Um, so the network has to learn to recognize the albatross in all of those different scales. But um, when we transfer to a task where scale is actually relevant, for example, uh, in medical images, the viewpoint is often fixed and, and scale has a, has a physical um, counterpart. So we know the lesion size, for example, already from the dimension of the image. And, and so when we transfer uh, to this kind of applications, uh, the, um, the, this learned invariance automatically might be um, this automatically learned invariance might be actually detrimental to the transfer. So our goal was to uh, find a way to keep the benefits of transfer learning while removing the implicitly learned scaled invariance. And to do so, we built on top of our research on deep learning interpretability with uh, regression concept vectors, um, for which we now have also um, an available tool on, uh, PIP, uh, on the PIP library. So the idea here is to define a concept, a measure in the image, and to learn this concept as a linear regression in the internal activation of your networks. Um, and what we did, for example, how, how did we apply regression concept vectors in this, uh, in this uh, applications? So we model scale, the scale of the object as a bounding, the bounding box ratio uh, with respect to the image size. And we then use these quantities as our concept measures and we use them to train a linear regression model on the internal activations of our, our model that was training, um, that was classifying image net inputs. So for example, here, the, the yellow layer in the image uh, is the, is, represents the set of internal activations at, the, at a given layer in Inception V3 with ImageNet pre-trained weights. And we use these uh, inputs and the, the, the value of the bounding box ratio with respect to the image size of the object of interest to learn a, regression, a linear regression model. And the predictive performance of the regression model on unseen images is informative on how well scale information is encoded at each layer. Because if the network is encoding this um, feature of scale uh, in the internal representations, then we can see this from um, a good linear regression prediction. Um, so then I will show you the main result of our analysis. So on the left, uh, we're here reporting here the performance of the regression um, measured by the determination coefficient R squared, R squared that expresses how well the regression is capturing the scale variation. And the performance is evaluated on a, test of, uh, a set of test images at each layer of inception V3. So you can see that early layers seem to have uh, probably a too small receptive field to train the regression. So the scale information is already present in these layers, but by especially averaging the responses, we don't capture the global scale because the receptive field is too narrow. But as soon as we go deep enough in the layer, in the, in the network, we manage to, uh, find a, uh, to find a good regression of scale information 
and we reached maximum performance at uh, layer mixed eight with R square of uh, 0 0.83. And after this layer, we see that there is again a decrease in the, um, in the R squared that we interpret as the point where invariance is actually starting to be learned. And these layers are essentially those that are learning to map features at a different scale to the same object class. Um, so to improve the transfer to data sets where scale is actually relevant, we can prune off these layers, removing this behavior. Referring to medical tasks uh, where image scale matters. Um, so for example, we took as application, uh, a new pathology problem, uh, that is of expanding the actual data, the current data sets that we have with um, open uh, source um, images. Uh, for example, images belonging to the um, to to this, the um, collection of papers online and images that are available online, uh, but that mine uh, reported um, with a precise scale of resolution reported. So, if we knew the magnification of these open access images here uh, on the left, for example, we would be able to add um, the second row. Um, of this table to our image data at the resolution of 10x. So we could enlarge even more our data sets. And um, so uh, what we did is essentially taking our analysis and the quantification of scale invariance. And um, we defined a pruning strategy that looks at where the, um, the peak is and where the invariance is starting to be learned. And we prune off those layers where the invariance is starting to be learned. And then we reevaluate the transfer and the performances of our task on the medical task. And we see that um, if we compare the mean er average error of um, regressing the, the area of the nuclei in the images at different scales, um, removing the, the layers where scale invariance is learned is actually improving um, the performance of the network. So we, we think that this is due to the fact that our pruning is removing those layers where the scale invariance is being learned. And this is why uh, the pruned uh, network is performing better. And so the last topic for today, finally, is on going beyond the explanation and incorporating users' feedback during network training. So in some applications, we may know, for example, that uh, some concepts should be encouraged during training because they are those used by the experts to make decisions. And similarly, we may know that other concepts should be discarded. So to put this in a graphical representation, let's suppose that we have a clinicians here, a clinician here that is the end user of our computer data diagnostic tool where, where a CNN uh, with interpretability is suggesting to look at certain tumorous area. So the outcome of the decision taken by the combo of the clinician and the support tool will then have a considerable impact on the diagnosis and the treatment planning and so an impact on the life of the patient. So this is where we care uh, about having a CNN with interpretability um, because we want to make sure that the CNN and the clinician are on the same page about the values and factors taken into consideration during the decision making. At the same time, we know though that there could be some specific targets that the clinician would like to actively change like as a feedback loop on the interpretability analysis and on the training of the network, then the clinician might see, for example, that nuclei size should be uh, preferred and should, be, um, should receive more focus from the network when making the decision because it's a relevant um, feature. Um, whereas image domain, for example, so the staining variations or the, um, the center where the, where the image comes from, uh, might not be relevant for the final classification. And we would like to insert this, um, this knowledge um, in the training of CNNs. And that's uh, what we're proposing in our paper, uh, getting CNNs towards relevant concepts by adversarial and multitask learning. Um, so th the idea is combining multitask and adversarial learning. Uh, so we add um, as parallel branches, the learning of a list of um, I'm calling them here control targets. So it means uh, whatever kind of feature the clinician would like to be encouraged. Um, and these targets correspond to our prior knowledge uh, about our tasks, for example. So in this, uh, in this way, uh, as, is, as it presented now, uh, this is a traditional multitask learning setting. 
And we know that the effect of multitask learning is that it will bias the network to learn representations that can accommodate best the main task and the extra task. So in this case, for example, we have the main task M and it has best representations A, B, and D. And A and D are also shared by the auxiliary tasks. So we know that the network is gonna prefer one of these two, A and D, um, over the other configurations because it can satisfy both the main task and the, and the auxiliary task. Now we can further combine this by uh, adding adversarial learning. So we, we had this idea of switching the, um, Um, so introducing a gradient reversal operation that would discover, discourage learning of undesired concepts. I mean, this wasn't our idea. This was already done in the literature, but we thought of combining these two multitask and, and adversarial learning so that we could um, obstacle, we, can, we could favor in the, the learning of desired targets and at the same time obstacle the, um, the learning um, on targets that we might not want. Um, and, and this is the way I see it and the way I represent it uh, um, with sets. Um, so for example, we might have um, that the combination of multitask uh, biases towards the solutions A and D, by, but by adding an additional adversarial task that has a minima in D, we then can drive the optimization to end up um, on A, so on the best solution that can accommodate all of our tasks. And we, we applied this structure essentially to our breast cancer um, histopathology target. And we, we, um, we encourage the learning of concepts such as uh, nuclei area, nuclei count, uh, the contrast uh, of the texture within the nuclei. And at the same time, we discourage, for example, the learning of the center uh, from where the images were recorded. So the domain essentially. And we see that the results improved on, um, on unseen patients and the uh, contribution of the adversarial branch helped us con consist considerably improving the generalization of images from unseen domain. Um, and about this paper, I, I still have to say that we're still testing and perfectioning this approach. We're still um, trying to find the best way to, um, to tune it. So we're currently uh, still working on it, but I think it's, um, it's quite an interesting idea. And so, in conclusion for today, um, and I would like also to give some takeaways for, for this talk, of this talk, um, we pointed at uh, meets in interpretable AI and common places. And I think that most of these derive from the definition of interpretability itself that is variable, uh, depending on the application scope on the domain and obviously also on the human a receiver of the explanation. So depending who, who and what we're targeting with our interpretability analysis, we then might have a different definition. And we need to keep in mind that, um, that the, the field is still trying to find uh, an agreement uh, on what is generally understood as interpretability. Um, uh, yes, um, generally understood as interpretability. Then another thing that we that we observed is that uh, state of the art uh, explainability methods uh, still need further developments for histopathology, so are still incomplete and still don't uh, directly address all the needs of histopathology images. Um, and we also saw, I think, in with my latest with the two papers uh, that I presented at the end that interpretable AI practices can be used even beyond the purpose of explaining. So we, they can really be relevant for improving the model performance. Um, and, and I hope that I managed to convince you of this. So yeah, with this, I think this is the end of, uh, of my talk. And if you have uh, questions, I would be really happy to answer. <laughs>